welcome to the Village Green NBTV show on the environment in Newport Beach. Today we're going to be visiting our utilities department and man do they do a lot for our environment and we're just going to be touching the very top of it. They've got so many things they do but we're going to look at three things today that they do to keep our city healthy and clean. Well, I'm here on a gloomy day with Mark Vakoyevich, who's the head of the utilities department. And I'm going to do a little, little editorial right here and probably going to tick off some of the other departments. But in some ways, yours is the most the important department in the city. I mean, community development talks about our houses, but we could all live in a lot smaller houses and everything and, and, and survive. And, um, but utilities, I mean, water, can't, we can't live without water sewer. <laughs> we're all going to get sick if the sewer system doesn't work. And you do a lot of other things, one of which we're going to talk about right now. So tell us about what we're doing here. Okay, sounds good. And I, and I, I can't have the utilities department take full credit for that, Nancy. <laughs> Bye -bye. We're just one, uh, I think, important piece of the bigger puzzle, but, <laughs> because we need all these services. Here oh, well, too, of so. course we do, I but, know, I know. but okay. still, I think they're really important. <laughs> Thank you. We think uh, this is important stuff too. And uh, so what we want to show you today is one of our 89 tide valves that we have here at the city. And these valves, um, we have to open and close almost every day because of the tides as they go up and down. And as we get rain or we have any water in the streets, we need these valves either to be open, but on a high tide, you, and we can see later out here, the tide's actually low now, we can go ahead and open these valves. And so we're gonna introduce uh, Todd here and he's gonna walk us through how they open these valves. And then, and then I'm gonna talk about why does Todd do this and why can't it just be done with a snap of a fingers? <laughs> okay, well, let's start. So what's, what's, what sort of notice, how do you know? You just look and you look at the tide charts and you know certain times of a day? We, we have charts and different crews. We have about 35 or 40 guys that do different tide shifts all hours of the day and night. Tide, of course, comes up uh, twice a day, every 24 hours. And there's about 15 to 45 actual uh, off normal duty tide shifts that we have to cover with about 25, 35 people. And that's without rain, just normal day tide going up and down. So as Mark mentioned, we have 89 valves that we have to man. Depending on how high the tide is, the higher the tide goes, the more valves you have to turn on both the peninsula and Balboa Island. And this is just a simple valve, 29th Street. This is a typical valve we open and close probably 15 to 45 times a month to prevent this entire block out onto Newport Boulevard from, from flooding with salt water. Okay, so I, that's interesting because I think a lot of people are aware of, t of the tide valves, but they think of them in terms of king tides and a big surf or something, like really rare occasions, but this is obviously not rare. No, as I said, 15 to 45 times a month typically, at least for the last 19 plus years I've been here, uh -huh. um, the street ends will be flooded and homes and garages and, and streets will be shut down. Right. So it's, it's often. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about the future in, in a minute, but all right, let's see what you do. So if you come out here and this looks like nothing to most of us, but for you, this is the, the entry. Right. So this is just a typical street end. And of course the bay is here. There's a seawall here. We have a valve system underneath to prevent uh, salt water from coming into our storm drain system. So we have simple valves on the end of each street end going down the peninsula and Balboa Island. So I'm just going to close this one and I'll show you how, how it works. And Todd, let's go ahead and normally Todd would just have his uh, wrench go right through the hole, but we're gonna, let's go ahead and open this so we can actually see the action sure. as we're doing that. So so we have these specially rigged up so we can go in oh, here, just, just open it like a key. and close in a key and, and move very quickly. But we're going to go ahead and open this one. You can see it's a, just a typical guillotine valve. It just slides up and down um, with the turn. <laughs> That's open. a great name. Right? <laughs> so like everything, it's righty-tighty, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. Okay. Well, so my, my husband's always trying to remind me of that. Right? <laughs> so it's just turning it to the left is, is what opens it. And you can see as I turn it to the left, oh, uh, yeah. counterclockwise, you uh -huh. can see the water vacate back to the uh -huh. bay. Uh-huh. 
and now you have a regular system just like every other city once this is open. When it's closed, we have to keep a, a watchful eye on any main breaks or rain or any spills so that they don't go into our system. As soon as all these are open, like I said, we're just like any other regular city. But while they're closed, uh, you really have to keep a watch on them. Now, is this uh, water, is this fresh water from ur urban runoff or is this salt water that's come in? This is salt water as our valves are not perfectly sealed. They're basically metal on metal. <clears throat> and so there is always some leakage through the seawall underneath into the system and through the valve itself. So typically uh, often when you open a valve, there will be water going back and forth because there was leakage when it was closed and pressurized. Okay. So the fresh water goes out the, the storm drain there. That's right, yeah. Okay. But most of this water is actually seawater, which is basically groundwater that's come through. So just yeah. like if we're doing construction here, we have to watch the tides as we're digging for our pipes because the water in the trench goes up and down with the tides. And it's the same thing. If the back pressure from the tide water comes back in here. And it's very, very cool. I mean, it's, it seems a very simple system, a very time-consuming system, but, but not a lot of bells and whistles you have to worry about. Yeah, it's pot metal under seawater, so we have to exercise and maintain these almost every day. Uh, um, do you, how, how often do you have to replace them? These last about 15 years, okay. these particular ones, but you can see it, it's meant to be very simple and very quick. And, uh, and we have a couple other locations. We have a dozen locations where we have an electric motor and we have some automation there. But as you can imagine, you don't have room for all that automation and electric equipment and all these locations. And then when you think about power outages and rain events and things like that, you know, that really compounds the situation. So you ask yourself, well, do I need a generator for at this location? Do I need uh, what a kind of extra thing? So we've found over the years, simple, easy, fast and effective are, are, the, are the best ways here. So it, on those ones where you have electric motors, can you still do them manually if you have to? Yes, we can, okay. we can. Yeah, okay. it's a little bit of a different setup, but you can and... Um, and okay, well, and let, let's talk about then the future. We've got sea level rise, and I know the city's looking at it, particularly on areas like this, but a lot of people haven't considered is what you just mentioned, the groundwater rising as well. So how is that going to affect this system? Well, it's a good question. I mean, as, as it goes up, obviously the walls are going to have to go higher here too. I mean, the future really seems to indicate, just like what we're planning on Balboa Island, which is an automated pump system, where you take large areas and you collect that water and you pump it. And you seal that system so you can kind of build area-wide automation as opposed to you know, individual spot automation. So do you see these becoming obsolete under that system or would they augment it? Um, these would be, they would be part of, no, they, they would be augmented. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we'd come up with some other sort of automated uh, valve system that can open and close, because you still have to open and, and close these. Yeah. Well, well, it's just going to get more and more expensive for, for us, building on areas we probably shouldn't have built on if we thought about it all that time ago. Uh, uh, Everybody should live in Crone Mar, where I am. We, you know, we've got <laughs> a lot of bluff yet to worry. We don't have to worry about some of this. Well, this yeah. is interesting. I've never, I've never seen one of these, and I'm, I'm. It's fascinating how well it works. Just shoo. All right. Well, thank you so much. You're this very is welcome. very interesting. And then, Todd, when are you going to be back to open this? <laughs> well, it, it's open now. So I it mean, was uh, closed to close this it. morning. I closed it this morning at about 3:15 a.m. and. It's open now, we're good. Uh, tonight, someone else will come in and he will close it at about 3.30 uh, in the morning. Oh, so you guys uh, change off, so some of you have early dawn patrol and others then the next week you don't or something? We have to, our management does a fantastic job of flip-flopping us, keeping us busy, keeping us um, with enough sleep yeah. and making sense of all of this madness. <laughs> and, Is that part of it computerized? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or are we still doing post-its. <laughs> you got to do both, you know. <laughs> a good electronic system starts with a good paper simple system too. Yeah, how long does it take if you're well, going to do it? It depends on if it's summer and there's traffic. Um, you can, oh. I've seen shifts go up to eight and a half hours, but yeah. if it's real quick, it's middle of the night, I've seen shifts go all the way down to four and a half hours on a smaller tide. 
I didn't even think about that on a busy summer day or something when you have to do it with no parking on the peninsula. Oh yeah, on the yeah. Island. Can you imagine? I mean, trying to you know pull in vehicles back and forth on the island here in the peninsula during the summertime, and so we just got to plan ahead. Sometimes we'll do it earlier than or later, you know, depending on the time to to make it more effective. Well, I, I just as I say, I, I find it interesting that it, we're so used to just everything electronic that so much of the city, well, I shouldn't say, but a lot of the city still runs on just people doing certain things that can only be done that way, or are done most optimally still that way. That's right, yeah. Okay, well, great. Thanks. So this is an impressive uh, piece of equipment. What is this? Yeah, thanks, Nancy. This is our one of our city vectors. We have about four of these vacuum large semi-trucks. And what we're going to show you today is some of our catch basin cleaning. As you know, we have about uh, 3,000 of these catch basins. You see them all throughout the streets. And all of them need to be cleaned every single year, at least once. In a lot of locations, we clean them four times a year. And so we're going to show you, um, through our, one of our uh, crew members here, how we clean them, why we clean them, and, and kind of what's the process. OK, so a lot of, of the year, at least some of them have uh, some kind of protection so they don't get as much stuff in them, right? That's right, that's right. But you remove it when the rain starts, or hopefully the rain starts. <laughs> that's right. So some of them, um, like during the summertime, we'll put a screen in front of them, the location, and then other ones we have actually a, a, like a bag that catches or a screen inside the catch basin. But a lot of our drains are very shallow, and so we can't put some of those things in there. So we just have to do more cleaning of them. All right, and so this is gets attracts everything from leaves to plastic bags to anything that gets on the street. That's right, that's right. All the trash that you see in the gutter. And we try to catch a lot of that trash by street sweeping. And that's one of the main reasons why we sweep every week, right? To try to capture all this little trash that's out on the streets every single week. So. All right, and this is who I have here. So this is uh, Ray. Hi, Ray. How you doing? And how long have you been with the city? 19 years. Well, what a co coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> 19 years. So. Tell me about your rig here. This is a Vactor. This is ours for the storm drain crew that we use almost daily. Uh -huh. And we clean boxes and storm drains and whatnot. So you have a routine that you, you have a schedule, you know where to go. Yes, when. we do. And obviously you can't do it when it's raining. Yes. So you have to stop there. But So you go out every day? Just about every day. And on, on one like this, would this be a, like a once a year or more? Yes, once a year. Once a year. But I, I, I just as a night, there are still a lot of catch basins that the city doesn't, they aren't the cities. They are like gated communities and everything. Do we do any of theirs or do they clean theirs or we just, nothing happens in those? <laughs> uh, well, they, they do do their cleaning, but those are those gated HOA communities and uh, they do some cleaning. We just don't monitor it or um, do any of the cleaning for them. Uh, but, you know, that's something, remember the Water Quality Committee was talking yeah. about that too. Yeah. That is something we should probably look back into and seeing if we can kind of get a schedule from them and coordinate from them as yeah, well. Yeah, that would that. be great. Okay, so tell me tell me the process. You, you say, all right, this is, I'm going to be at uh, 29th and Villa this morning. Yes. And you pull up, now, do you mark this ahead of time? Like, don't park here? We usually have a no parkers out here okay. for certain ones. Uh -huh. That one, we don't need one because it's, we'll just block off traffic. Okay. But uh, we just pull up and we set the machine up to where it's available to suck the box out and clean it. Okay, and we're gonna see that in action in a minute, yeah. but what happens, all right, so it comes all into this big truck and does anything happen inside there? No, it just gets uh, stored in the tank and then we have a special disposal area where we separate the water and the trash and then dump the trash. And then this, this is really kind of one of three things that we do for catch basin cleaning. We, we do have a contractor that helps us with catch basin cleaning too. That way we can get all of our production numbers and all of our peaks. We do have a smaller vacuum truck for smaller, tighter locations. And then of course we have this big one. Okay. And so that's what we're gonna show you today. All right, and you separate, go back a minute. You separate it out. What do you do with, with the trash after it's the water's taken out? So that trash all uh, gets combined with all of our uh, drainage trash that we collect and street sweeping trash, and it goes to the landfill. Okay, it goes yeah. to the landfill. So the, the more we can cut down on stuff getting in there, the better because of all of, well, not just for the environment, of course, but also for the city budget because we have to, yeah, have that's to pay right. for all those and things. I, and I looked at the number um, just before we got here. It was 295 tons of trash that we removed last year from our catch basins. 
that, that's just your, that is amazing. That's just the trash base. That isn't all the garbage trucks coming through. That's not the garbage trucks. That's not the street sweeping. That's just what's inside these boxes that we catch every year. Okay. Uh, Everybody, we've really got to think about our packaging. We've got to really think about <laughs> recycling. We've got to do better. <laughs> all right. So let's see the process. So Ray can control the engine through here for the engine speed, how much vacuum pressure, or vacuum suction. Now he's lowering the boom down and Todd's helping him get lined in there. And then pretty soon you're going to start hearing the bits and pieces of dirt and debris and things like that being sucked up by the, by the machine. This catch basin has some like sand and, and dirt in it, so we're going to add some water to it to be able to, to really clean it out. That one was, wasn't that bad, so. And that's the general process right there, Nancy. Is that how long it usually takes? Or is yeah, that it's, it's pretty quick. I mean, these boxes are not that big. I mean, this is a, a very typical box. You know, it's only a four, four feet by four feet inside. We have boxes that are much larger that are, you know, 10 to 20 feet in size. But this is very typical. So you go in there, set up, vacuum, wash it out, and move on to the next one. It's all about trying to get production and make uh -huh. it simple. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. All right, well, so, all right, what's our next adventure? All right, so we are replacing water meters throughout the city. And what we're doing now with these water meters is, is we're putting in these digital water meters, which are basically uh, automated read meters, so we won't have to send out a meter reader to every single house every single month. I know, I chuckle because every once in a while I'll be upstairs and I'll hear this clink clink and I'll think, what's that? And then I realize it's uh, usually a young fellow who's, th and I think, well, that's funny that we are still doing that but we're going to get away from that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have 26,000 of these water meters throughout the city. And so there's a person every month that comes out there to read these, even though you're billed every other month. Uh -huh. And so now we're in the process of, you know, we need to change out these meters because they're old. And now we're going with the, the newest technology, which are these, what's called um, advanced uh, meter infrastructure. But anyway, long story short, it's a digital meter that has an antenna on it. And so we're going to walk you through and show you what this meter looks like. Okay, well, first of all, does everybody that has a meter like the old fashioned kind of meter, is every one of those going to be replaced? Yes. So this is the new one. This is the latest and the greatest here. And uh, it's a, again, like we talked about with the storm drain system, creating simplicity, right? So the, the bones of the meter are almost identical to the existing meter. The technology works well as a, as a turbine inside that spins and measures how much water you use. The difference here is, is now um, it, this one's going to be taking a dial gauge, but a lot of them are digital, and then it transmits it through this little battery and antenna right here through your meter box. And every single day, only once per day, it's going to send a signal to an antenna with all of your meter information. And with that meter information, we have 24 hours worth of water use data, which we'll have and we can use that for, and which we've already been doing right now, for leak detection. I was just gonna ask about that. Oh, that's great. And then um, here in the, in the coming months, we're gonna be able to give customers, residents, access to their own water meter data as well. So if they wanna see, uh, you know, if they've been using how much water they've been using for their irrigation, you know, if they wanna quantify, you know, if someone in the house is taking too long of a shower, they could do all kinds of different <laughs> things like that with with this information now too. But the main thing we're gonna be using it for is for meter reading and then also for leak detection. Okay, so then another issue that, that the uh, Water Quality Committee has actually talked about for <sighs> decades, I think. Will this help us get to the point where, particularly during drought conditions, we can set levels of fees and say, okay, this is the average and you're fine here, but if you use more, 
you're going to pay more. It's always been awkward because our system just wasn't really robust enough to handle all that information. Will this put us any closer to that? Uh, you know, if the electeds want to do that, yes. Oh, absolutely. I know that's always yeah. part of it. Yeah, but. absolutely. But th this collects, this will have data, right? You'll have 24 hours worth of data every single day. Right now, we come, drive by, crack this thing open, read the number, put it in the pad, and go on to the next right. one. So it's just a, one spot in time. This gives people the data on their own water use, and then if there are, you know, tiers or restrictions, especially especially if we have a drought. Right. I mean, this is going to be super helpful uh, if we do have the next drought, you know, which is likely to happen, you know, always in the future. And yeah, well, we're a little and, behind right this already. So yeah, yeah, and and so th this will be a part of that solution. Great, great. Well, it's, so this, what is it? Very difficult to replace them. I mean. This is a, a bigger meter than normal. This okay. is an inch and a half water meter. So this takes a little more muscle and a little more wrenching to get it done. But for the most part, um, they're smaller and they're a little bit easier. So we have Kevin and Denny here who are going to replace this meter. This one actually goes to the irrigation system for this homeowners association. Oh, that's why it's bigger then. That's uh -huh. why it's bigger, exactly, yeah. And uh, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, walk you through a replacement. And uh, we have a contractor that's helping us do most of the work. And then we have city staff that's doing these. And anything that's uh, that's there that we need to fix, we're fixing uh, as we go, too. So so what's the longest period one of these has been installed? You know, the average life for these is about 20 years. But okay. uh, we have some that have been in, in the ground for 30 years. Well, of the old kind? Of the old kind, Not yeah. the new kind? The new kind, no. The battery life for these are supposed to be 15 to 20 years. But have we had any in the system long enough, in the ground long enough to say, oh, this is an issue, or they're, gee, they're behaving beautifully, or? Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we did a trial run of 250 of them, uh, and they've been in the ground for over a year. So we've learned a few things from, from that year's time. I th I'd say the biggest thing that we learned is, is that there's a tremendous amount of data. So you could, you can drown in data. <laughs> so is this, is this electric? The well, battery or? It's battery operated. Okay. Uh, and again, this battery is supposed to last 15 to 20 years. Okay, all right, so. And, and a lot of people ask, well, is it going to be sending out signals? How often? <laughs> and, and really, you Do know. We have in, to wear tinfoil caps. And yeah. <laughs> in order for this battery to last that long, it only it has to send that signal out just once a day. You know, if it was, if it was continuously sending out signals, the battery wouldn't last long. Okay. All right, so. Let's see it. Do your stuff. <laughs> and how often do you have to clean it? I mean, there's a lot of dirt and stuff in there. When we come out. When you come out. Yeah, when we come out you can just so how, how often will you do it with, with these new? Will you still have to come out and clean out you the... You still come out if a resident calls you, but we're not going to be coming out as much because it'll be digital. We'll be able to read it. But, I mean, yeah. dirt and stuff will still get in there, won't it? Well, it does. And so right now these are popped in uh, every month. And so uh -huh. with these new ones, we're going to be doing once a year. We're okay. Going to be checking just just once a year. look and make sure. Yeah. Hey, we need to get a little shovel out here or something. Okay. Exactly. When we right. leave, we'll make sure it's as clean as possible. Uh-huh. And then hopefully we'll uh, So the first thing is, is they shut off the valve. This this valve here is is uh, called a curb valve or uh, a curb stop. And yeah, cause, uh, because there's it's a curb right there. At the curb. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I got that one. And this is you know a, a city function. Kevin, you can go ahead and keep okay. working as we go to. But you know plumbers will, or a, a homeowner has an issue with their plumbing. They call us. We come out, turn off. This is a city valve. Oh, okay. And uh, we'll come out and turn them off. And we have. Uh, dozens of service calls every day to come out and turn these things on and off, help plumbers, help homeowners. Well, that, but that's got to be a pretty big plumbing issue then, because I mean, I, my plumber's never done that. He just turns the water off at the house. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of times the house valve doesn't work. Oh. And they got to come okay. out here and turn it off at the meter valve too. So if you have a good house valve, then you're, you're set. Oh, you're okay. So yeah. Are there grants? <laughs> yeah. In fact, we received a one and a half million dollar federal grant uh, for this project. So. Uh, that was very helpful in, in making this project happen. And, you know, this is a $9 million investment that we're making because it's 26,000 meters. And to get a million and a half dollars uh, um, in funding was made this thing happen, put it over the, the line. So how long do you think it will take to replace all of them? Our plan is to finish everything in two years. Wow, that's, that's so fast. We did the trial, like I said, 250 meters last year. And then we started in November replacing. We've already replaced uh, about 2,000 of the 26,000 meters, and uh, and our goal and plan is to wrap this up in two years. Mm -hmm. so. Speaking of grants, uh, city staff, I have to tell you, is 
amazing at getting grants. You guys really do keep an eye out for possibilities. I know a lot of our water quality projects have been grant funded, and it's neat to see that that, uh, that we don't just depend upon the general fund for everything. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Now this whole function here with is is water related, so drinking water related. So it comes uh, out of uh, people's you know monthly water bill or bi-monthly water bill, and uh, you know folks pay a. A monthly charge, which is basically to have the meter, have the service, have the meter reading, things like that, and then they pay on how much they use, right. which is that measurement. Yeah, there's a flat fee and then the other fee. Now, is this? I, I noticed I got a notice that there was they're putting in for an increase. Was it for the water or was it for the sewage or for both or? Well, the sewage, um, it's a little bit for both, right? Okay. We're, we're the water increase, right? It had has not been increased since 2014. And right. So 2019 or two, uh, was our first water rate, or two, excuse me, 2020 was our first water rate increase in six years. And uh, so that's increasing. But the sewer rates are also increasing a little bit. You know, the average house pays about um, $13 a month for their sewer service. Right. You know, it's, it's ridiculously low it's, when it's, you think of how important it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think it's just a great, it's a great value in comparison to, you know, a lot of other costs and it's a necessary thing. We have to, we have to, when we want to take away your sewage. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Kevin, how long have you been with the city? 16 years. Going on 16 years. Hmm? Yeah. And Denny, how long have you been with the city? 32. <laughs> sure. So we got lots of knowledge and experience here. Yeah, well, you see that, but the the problem is that that when people retire, you lose all that so many times. It's it's. Uh, yeah, but, but but we you know I think we do a good job of of, of teaching and training and okay. mentoring and, and and that's the key. You know, so when you operate a water and wastewater system, we have to have somebody on call and ready to respond for emergencies all the time. So, you know, we're here during the day, Monday through Friday, but every evening and every weekend. Uh, there's a person like Kevin here who takes a cell phone and a pager and uh, and if, if there's a problem the police department calls him out and he's here within 30 minutes to take care of it and then mobilize a crew to fix whatever needs. But don't, as I recall when we visited the yard, you also have a system that alerts you to, to certain things. We do and that's for like uh, more of the kind of the com complex things like okay. the pressure, the chlorine. Oh, okay what pumps are working, things like that. But let's say uh, somebody notices a water leak or somebody has a, literally a, a meter problem where they can't turn on or off their water, or there's a break in the street, or there's a sewage spill or something like that, that doesn't come in, you know, through an automated system. Uh -huh. They come in through a dispatch system and, and then uh, our crews come out for that. Look at the little trick on this gasket here where it has these ears so you can drop them in and then the screws will catch right here. Oh. Uh, uh, drop in gasket. Gosh. I wish I had more of these for like automotive things that I'd end up working <laughs> on. Is it, what, what method are you using to schedule replacements? Are you going like big areas at a time or so newer have, areas first because they're easier? Or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so our schedule really is following the routes that we have. Yeah. So we have several dozen routes. And so right now we're doing this route, believe it or not, the name, are you ready for this? Is called the big route. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so the big route is being replaced. And then we'll have the little route and the medium size. Exactly. And okay. And, and, and those big routes and things like that are a little more spread out because of the certain sizes of the pipes and systems. But soon enough, probably by April or May, we're going to be literally just hitting uh, blocks of neighborhoods at a time. Yeah. So when you get to an area, say, like the old part of Corona Del Mar, and they're all in the alleys, in the middle of the alleys. So you just, what, block off the alley for a couple, an hour or so while you do them, or how are you going to do that? Yeah, usually we'll, we'll send a door hanger to each of the properties there ahead of time, let them know we're going to be working, and uh, the staff will come out. They have to knock on the door real quick, turn off the, the water, which is going to take about five minutes, and so we'll let the people know if they're home, hey, we're going to be turning off your water, and then make the replacement. Now, they'll be in the alleys. In some cases, they can be parked off to the side, and it's not an issue. In some uh -huh. cases, they do need to block it temporarily. But they can move pretty quick, and... and uh... now, this looks just, from the eye, eyeballing, it looks almost like that's a little bit taller than this, is it? 
It is, yeah. Okay. So that head has some more of the electronic components. Okay, but it's, uh, to it, it, yeah. it's, it still fits within the. Yes, yeah. Yeah, this is just one small puzzle piece of the whole water system, right? It's just this whole metering, which is really tied into our customer service um, that we do. But Kevin's also on the crew where we do a lot of the repair work. So sometimes they'll come out to these water meters and that valve doesn't work anymore, right? Because that valve was built in the 1950s. And so they'll have to come out and replace that valve uh, yeah. before they do the meter. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I think what is, has been so illustrative today is all of the stuff we don't see, <laughs> all the working parts, and how much of it, as I say, we, we live in this electronic world, and yet it's still one person going out and doing a job that's critical to the city. Uh, we just, we don't think about that enough. Yeah, I mean, it, maybe it's compared to like, uh, you know, bees. There's just a lot of bees that are always <laughs> out there working they're a necessary part of nature, right? But this is a necessary part of, you know, city life. Uh -huh. And of course, you notice us when we bunch up together and there's a lot of us in our big yellow trucks, maybe right. just like the bees when they bunch yeah. up. <laughs> okay, moment of truth. Yeah, so then if you have a goal, you go, all right, time out, start over. Uh, done that. <laughs> yeah. We've all seen it. Yeah. Uh, and just like anything, you turn the valve on really slow. slow. So now we're going to put the battery uh, and antenna through this uh, hole in this water meter box. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. So that'll just and that's start. It. That's it. And that's the, that's the antenna right there. Okay. And then we have a new, brand new water meter box uh -huh. uh, with a city seal on it. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. And so one of the things we're finding with leaks, too, is now that this starts measuring, especially in the middle of the night. So what's one of the telltale signs of a leak is, is if you're using water continuously in the middle of the night, very small amount, yeah. then it triggers our alarm system. And then we send a notice to the owner saying, we think you have a leak. Now, soon enough, the residents will have access so they can see, see it themselves, uh -huh. too. But uh, that's what it will be doing. Well, cause that's, that's really important because I, I understand that uh, between our big pipes and everything, there obviously there's a certain amount of, of leakage, but there's probably a certain amount that we don't know about. I mean, we don't really trace it very well that we'll be able to do a much better job of now and save more water that way as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you think about a, a typical home, you know, just a little toilet flapper valve can leak a little bit of water. The irrigation system, you know, uh -huh. the backflow device may be leaking in the backyard a little bit, just a small amount, but those small amounts add up to lots yeah. of water. Yeah. Well, excellent work. <laughs> Kevin, yeah. Kevin, Very Kevin, good. Kevin, good job, Kevin. Thanks, I Kevin. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Mark, for Thanks. sharing Thanks, some yeah. of this. and. Uh, We'll come back for some more. I know okay. you've got lots of other parts Please, that we got work. lots of other things we'll show you. <laughs> All, right, All right, good. Well, that was our show. And I hope that you were as impressed as I was with the efficiency that this crew goes around and helps our city, our streets, our water quality, just everything, our drinking water and everything else, stay so much cleaner. So thanks to the ut utilities department. And until next time, let's all work on making our village green.